I, we'll just get into this. This is the Grabbing the Brisket podcast, guys. Hey, hey, wherever it, Henderson and Kane's general store. It's like you, you guys are bringing the small town vibe into the big city of Houston. And that, we, we had a conversation a little bit earlier talking about uh, um, just Houston just being this just, just vast culture of just di- very diverse uh, culinary, uh, we'd say different styles of cooking, food. Uh, the food scene is just all, you know, it, it's amazing. Just, it, it's it, huge. It is. It, yeah, and I always thought myself it's like it's probably the best like food scene in, in I'm going to say the United States, but maybe the world. I don't know. I have not traveled abroad, so I don't know what it is like <laughs> over there. But yeah. uh, I think That's Houston weird. just kind of has it all. And uh, very fortunate to be here with John and Veronica here uh, at Henderson and Kane. Uh, this is a really cool joint that you got here. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I guess I mean obviously we we we've, we've seen you guys. Y'all y'all started in 28. Yeah, we've been here since 2018. Um, took us roughly almost a year to open up the place before that. Okay. Um, but we uh, originally started in a food hall, believe it or not. So nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't mind, kind of give us a little a little backstory of this of this area, this building, uh, and then kind of what it you know what what it means to to be here. You know. Sure. The building is super important in our lives um, for sure. Uh, my wife is an architect by trade, and uh, graduating from the University of Houston, she spent all of her studies uh, here in town, kind of studying Houston in general. Um, and really, when we met, it was because she was to be the architect for the restaurant that I wanted to put here. Uh, a mutual friend introduced us, uh, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Um, <laughs> nice. But the building is, is uh, really great. It's been here since 1937, serving this old neighborhood. Uh, as a general store uh, started by uh, uh, the Scardino family. <clears throat> and uh, a couple of families have had it since then, um, and it's kind of changed just like the city has changed. Uh, the culture of the ownership, uh, the culture of the neighborhood, uh, it's really been, it's really gotten the full, you know, work over with the amount of diversity that comes over, you know, that's here in Houston anyway. Um, and I think you're right. I think um, it's world class here. Um, and I think it starts with how many people are willing to work hard here in Houston. A lot of other cities don't have that same, uh, that grind work ethic that you'll find in Houston. And yeah, that's uh, a risk, right? It's it a, is. It's a big risk. And yeah. so people are willing to, to do it here. And it's probably one of the best cities that I've worked in, uh, born and raised here. But but uh, unbiased opinion is that, again, it's, it's just a really good place to open, uh, serve people, hardworking people. Uh, and it's great. And so, again, 1937. It's traded hands. We've been here for five years now, and uh, we really enjoy it. It's really, it feels like you're not at the edge of downtown. So while you're in the middle of everything, you can walk in here, and we get it a lot from customers that tell us that um, it just feels like they're somewhere else, mm-hmm. and we like that. Everything from the music to the food to the what's hanging on the walls is a part of that for us, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think for me, what it really ties to is I feel like there's this real lack of uh, appreciation for Houston's history uh, Mm -hmm. that happens in the city. And to have a building like this and an opportunity to preserve it and to almost um, put it on a pedestal and and really highlight in a way, highlight the building in a way that hasn't really been done before. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, this building's been here a long time, but it's been overlooked for many, many years. So I think um, being in the old six ward and the amount of historic homes that are in this neighborhood, it really is just the perfect fit. And um, for me as an architect, it's really important. I, I'm originally from El Paso and you definitely get the sense of, of appreciation for history in a city like El Paso. But coming here, I feel like the city just experiences so much diversity and so much uh, transient Uh, Mm -hmm. traffic flow that it's really easy for people to come to the city and want to make it their own which ultimately results in this constant change Mm -hmm. and so I think that kind of adds to the lack of appreciation Uh, but meeting John and having someone that is a Houstonian born and raised it's kind of like you start to sense that there are a lot of people that do appreciate it and for me i mean that just kind of goes hand in hand as an architect to appreciate uh architecture yeah no definitely no the the, the store is beautiful right mm-hmm. so and when, you, when you walk in you, you you definitely have the feel of of kind of going back a little bit mm-hmm. um it's it doesn't you know i feel like uh 
I feel like you could have a line out the door and it it's not going to change the feel in here, right? It's it's still going to be like if you waited an hour in line, it, it wouldn't feel like you waited an hour in line because it just has this. I don't know. It's a vibe, of, right? Yeah. Like, yeah as soon yeah. as we walked it's in, very it, calming. the smell hit you. Yeah. Know, oh, my God. It smells yeah. so good. And then the mm-hmm. music, it's just yeah. it's really cool. Right on. Really yeah. cool. It is. You, like, slow, slow down a little bit, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. Every, everything outside us yeah. right now is just fast, fast. I get it done as quickly as possible. Uh, but you walk in an environment like this, it's like, okay, I can, I can relax a little bit. Mm-hmm. I can yeah. have a beer. I mean, I, I love the cooler. Uh, I mean, it, general store... Uh, me and Jan grew up in a small town with about 300 people or whatever and we had that general mm-hmm. store to where you mm-hmm. went and that's where you got everything I mean from buying your drinks your food your groceries uh, I mean everything was there at that yeah. one particular store probably about, maybe about the size of this of this building mm-hmm. to be honest with you so walking wow. in it kind of takes you back and yeah. uh, for us to go to like a normal grocery store it would have been um, probably a 45 minute drive and so mm-hmm. it's you just didn't you, you just didn't do that, you know, and having, you know, it was called Mallory's uh, mm-hmm. where, where we grew up and mm-hmm. having that there, you know, I, as a kid, I never, I never thought about like going to a Kroger's or anything. I'm like, no, we got a Mallory's. We got everything we need, you know. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, we also had the, you know, farmers, you know, and uh, ranchers there. So you always had fresh meat, fresh produce mm. um, and, and fresh eggs. So you, you grow up that way and you, you don't really think, you think everybody does and they, they don't, you know, so. It's cool that y'all have this vibe that you're you're putting out in this. You're sunk in a neighborhood, right? And you've got you have all these awesome houses around you. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was and, one of the first comments that we when we were pulling mm-hmm. up. Jan's like, "Hey, man, this is smack dab into a neighborhood." I'm yeah. like, "Man, you you guys are just supporting uh, this neighborhood." He's like, "That yeah. is that is well, pretty awesome." All of Houston, yeah. really, yeah. but yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. and yeah. vice versa, man. We we've seen the neighbors come out in full force and really get a lot more I think for their money quite frankly when you can attach a face to the jam that you're buying because you see in the family that did it yep uh, you know that money's going straight back to those people that live down the street from you or in your neighborhoods in your city um, and really this is what I remember Houston being like we would go visit cousins in different neighborhoods and every cousin that I go visit had a store in it that had something going on in the kitchen yeah Sometimes it was a fish joint mm-hmm. that sold groceries. Sometimes it was a burger joint that sold groceries. And usually I always felt like those were the best versions of burger or fried mm-hmm. fish and fries, right? Like as you were getting at this store, maybe it was just the feeling of it. Maybe the food was, you know, okay. But something about the whole package makes it yeah. better, I think. And so we remember stores like this. And that's why this building, again, I, I don't think it can be anything else. Mm-hmm. It, the way it's built, the way it's designed. Uh, where it is and and what's been here for you know since it's, uh, since it was built, I just don't think it can be anything else other than something that's serving the neighborhood or serving the local area for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, staying true, right? Staying true to what this this is, what it means to people. You know that they've grown up here, that have had you know, you know, you've, you've got you've got grandparents and and people that have been here their whole life, right? And then th- this this place has been something to them, yeah. and then, and you keeping that alive, yeah. you know, where it's they're able to take their kids to or their grandkids to and say, you know, I, I came here and it was this, you know, X amount yeah. of years ago. You yeah. know? No, that's very yeah. true. I mean, we have families that come in here that will say, oh, I, I saw the name in an ar- article and I knew exactly where it was. <laughs> yeah. And I had to come here. Or then we have other folks that will bring in their children, whether it's like an older generation, and then say, when I was little, the store was, and they fill yes. in the blank with what it was at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is also a really cool thing to say. Now, not all of them can remember the names, right, uh, which right, I think right. is kind of funny. But um, it's just interesting that they can remember who was behind the counter or how that person helped them yeah, um, yeah. or what they ate. Uh, yeah. At one point, it was a meat market. So uh, people remember coming here to buy uh, fajitas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. That's fantastic. And even the, uh, the original family, the Scardino name that I mentioned early on, <clears throat> they even had a small family reunion gathering here at the store and, you know, filled us in on the stories about their uncle and that had owned the place originally and how they sold it to their cousins, uh, you know, after they were done uh, working it. So it's just kind of like to see it. It's really, really cool. There's yeah. something to, something about it. I guess we're, we're nerds like that, and it really means a lot to us for sure. And now we see new generations coming through. We We do have a couple that came here early on in their relationship maybe first couple dates and then we saw them get engaged 
we saw them get married, and now they have a child. And so basically yeah. that whole story played yeah. out right here in our store. That's awesome. Yeah. And just, you know, man, there's just something really good about that stuff. And it's uh, you can't make it up, I guess. And so it just feels good to know that we can at least be here and be the, the stage for something like that. Sure. We yeah. even have little kids that come in and get gallons of milk that they can barely carry, but they feel so proud that they're taking it back home to mom down the street. Like yeah. something oh, about awesome. it, you know, something about it. It's a story I think is really great. And the food, you know, that's what keeps people coming back, I think, is just the old style, simple style barbecue. Everything's made in house, sausage is made in house. Everything's, you know, it's just, it's fantastic. So we feel good about it. And, uh, Customers seem to like it too. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> so so barbecue, right? So I get I get the uh, the preserving. I get I get the building, but barbecue. So you're you're a culinary guy, right? Is, is you're you're or you always wanted a restaurant or no, no no. So um so that there's some pictures here on the wall, and uh, that's my grandfather A C Signs, and he had a barbecue joint in Bryan, Texas, starting in the '60s. Uh, I was born in '73, and I spent ton of time in front of that brick pit um with him watching him do everything originally before they had the large brick pits they had a small ice house where they sold um tamales uh tamales and uh brisket and the brisket the tamales were made with smoked brisket um and serving beer and i can remember standing on the old wooden soda pop crate so i could play pool on the pool table because i was too little to reach it uh (laughs) And that's that building in the middle that you see there. Yeah. Uh, but just it, it, that's where it comes from. Um, I did, you know, I did have other jobs as I got older. And sometime after 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, I decided to go to Austin and live there and kind of got back into food. Mm-hmm. Started studying with they um, are working for a really fantastic chef, uh, Melissa Brinkman, there in Austin. And really reminded me how much I liked the kitchen. I mean, washing dishes is important in, in is. culinary, right? So, like, I kind of got that feeling back of working in the summers in my uncle's restaurant, working at my grandfather's restaurant, growing up in it. And it just really made me want to do it for myself. I think I was the happiest. I had gotten off of a shift. It was I was tired. I was exhausted. Um, but I remember feeling like I was really good about what I was doing. And that's, yeah. that was it. That was the start mm-hmm. of it for me, going back into it again. So <clears throat> family's been in the restaurant business for a while, and, and it just felt like it came full circle. I was the first grandson, uh, grandchild, uh, in that side of the family. And so I was, my mother says my feet barely touched the ground because they carried me everywhere around that restaurant, around <laughs> that store. And nice. I can remember my grandfather sweeping the floor and telling me about the restaurant business. I don't remember what it was and was probably way too young to comprehend but just how important it was to him i think um meant a lot and so that's why i feel like we do it here every day we painted this building white because the building in that picture is white uh my guys wear red aprons because my grandfather wore a red apron in his restaurant so little things like that that maybe don't go out into the public necessarily they just still mean something to us sure sure everything has a meaning right yeah it feels good man. john is an incredibly intentional person so there's always a meaning or a thought behind almost everything that he does. Yeah. No, almost. Definitely. <laughs> almost. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so it's, you know, I think, I, I don't know the, the exact, you know, I love when people throw out, um, like, like, um, I don't know what would you say, like, facts where they, they like, well, 60% of this, and you're like, well, is that true, you know? But, so I, I did, I did read, I did read this that, you know, Sixty uh, percent of restaurants fail after the first year, mm-hmm. right? And so that's that's like you got to get out of the first year, right? And then and then additionally, eighty percent of those that, that passed get, that got through the, the first year closing the first four years, right? So that that's a big thing, right? Restaurants, a lot of restaurants go in, but it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. I mean, you got to have the right location, right food, but even then, it doesn't matter, right? But the story, the story is what helps every restaurant mm-hmm. having that story. And I think you definitely guys have the people that. behind the story as well. That's right. right. That's right. And that's 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 the thing that helps people relate and go, yes, I can see this. It you builds know? a community, really. One hundred percent. I want to support. Yeah. Yeah. And and just just from hearing about you guys, reading about you guys, um, and then uh, obviously being here, I, I can see why. You know, uh, this is this has been. You know, this is this is this is y'all's hearts, right? This is y'all put everything into this thing. Yeah, definitely. So. And I mean, community is probably one of the most important things. Um, it's funny because I never, I never really, I always considered myself an introvert. 
Um, but then I started working in our restaurants and I realized how much I really enjoyed talking to one person at a time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And r- working the counter does that for you. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have a really great memory. So it allows me to really get to know someone after one visit. Right and on. so then it became this thing where it was like I wanted to get to know someone and then they would bring me something, someone else and I'd get to know them. And then I just came to realize like we have such strong relationships with our customers because we've gotten to know them over time. And I mean, even when we were first started in the food hall, it was just, we'd see the same group of guys and I'd joke with them, well, you guys didn't line up in the same order you did the last time, so I need you to rearrange <laughs> yourself so I remember <laughs> everybody's <laughs> name. Yep, that's it. <laughs> but um, it is really great to kind of know someone on that level and just know that, I don't know, it creates this really comfortable relationship. And for me, when people come in the door, I want them to feel like they're at home. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me really happy to hear you guys say that you feel that like sense of relaxation, because I want that for everyone that comes through the door. And, um, I feel like the first layer of that is smelling the food Mm -hmm, and walking in. But the other part of that is really the customer service part and getting to know people. And I always tell my, my, uh, staff, when you meet someone at the register, don't ask them what they want. Ask them how they're doing first. Yeah. Um, because mm-hmm. that opens things up into conversation. It really kind of disarms someone and makes them feel like they can be comfortable here. That's right. Um, and we're really not trying to rush anyone out the door. Yeah, yeah. Take your time, right? Hey, listen, h- how's your day going? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I-, I was shooting a little uh, just kind of like B-roll footage uh, inside the store. And, it, you know... I'm always kind of conscious of like if people in the shot, you know, I don't want to like get people in a camera because if they don't want to be in a camera, because I've seen too many videos of people like, oh, don't, don't, don't video me, <laughs> and then they go crazy, or whatever. So yeah. I'm just shooting, and I, I panned over, and there's a family sitting over in the corner, and I got almost to the, the to them, and I cut the camera off. Well, the the dad was just sitting there, just like throwing a peace sign up, <laughs> and then the mom was like this, and the kid, and he's like, oh. I, what did you do? And I'm like, oh shit! I didn't know you were trying to get in there. I said, let me do it again. And so I, I did it again. Uh, met them, super nice. They're talking about uh, the podcast or whatever, uh, and uh, just very just I get at home. You know, met Camille, the, and they're like, shit, I'm gonna follow you guys or whatever. I'm like, I already I love this place here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it's interesting because some of our employees will come work for us and have been at other places and some of the one of the first things that they always seem to mention is the people here are so nice so the customers are so nice here i'm not used to that you know they, they come from other places <laughs> yeah, and so yeah it's kind of like you, you there's i guess maybe it's unspoken that it's just not the place to be a jerk you know right. or, or kind of right. just let it, let's let's all meet here and kind of have a good time we something i learned from my grandfather is that we are you know when someone grabs the handle to your door <clears throat> what they're doing is they're coming in and putting their trust in you, right? They're about to pay you. They're going to sit down. They're going to spend their hard-earned money. They're going to spend their time. If they bring their family or their friends or relatives, they're they're kind of depending on you to help them, you know, show them a good time. And that's a big responsibility, and we want to take that seriously. And I think that first comes with, and it's, it serves both sides, but it, it comes with us making sure that people are welcome. If you're a nice person, you're a good person, you're always welcome here. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if you're not a good person, if you can just suspend that when you walk in the door and be nice <laughs> while you're here, hey, we're good with that too. But, you know, it just um, that's that's key. And and it's something that we can offer <clears throat> just by being who we are, I think, and asking our employees to be who they are. Yeah. Just, you know, just be who you are. When the nice. positivity and the warmth really, like, it's contagious. Mm-hmm. Sure. And um, customers are not nice because they came to see us. They it's like recip- there's something about that being reciprocated mm-hmm. so it's like they feel it so they give it off and then we give it off back and then it just kind of spirals into something that continues on to other people coming to see us sure. and so I mean even when I when I train our employees like they just listen to me I, I, the way that the way that I talk to people the things that I say I talk to them the same way I don't mm-hmm. treat them a any different than our customers and so you know like we're all human oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we we treat each other good and that's really you know it's when we don't have that that i take issue with someone sure. like you you don't even have to do the job right i'll show you how to do that <laughs> part but if you just come with a positive attitude the rest will kind of come that's at right. some right. point i that's think right. we get good feedback on that too but also i mean barbecue's friendly food i feel like you mm-hmm. know what i mean mm-hmm. I, 
it can be a competitive thing for sure, but you're kind of coming in here and we all know that it's been slow smoked for a while. We, you know, a lot of time has been put into it. We know it's uh, we know it is what it is, and there's a lot of expectations for barbecue in Texas, but in Houston especially, I think there's so much competition now. Uh, so many, so many places mm-hmm. slinging, slinging good brisket. Um, it's all about what, what else can you offer besides just that, that brisket, right? There's, there's a lot more to it, and, and that's just a little something that we, that we can offer for sure. Uh, we're, we're very lucky to have some really great employees, and some employees that have been with us for almost ten years at this point. Nice. Um, well, that says a lot for, about you guys, right? You know, Thank right. you. Uh, Thank yeah, you. that's but, a huge part of it, right? How you treat your employees—that's how they're going to treat your customers. That's right. Yeah, right, that's right. We want to feel good about when we're home and we're not here. We want to feel good about that, and right. um, and it, it does help. I mean, the the customers, uh, the audience is really the reason we're here. I mean, we opened the year before COVID, so that mm-hmm. happened. And while a lot of places were really struggling, we were fortunate enough to be able to hang on. Uh, with the support of the customers, and I think um, it made us want to work harder. Uh, you know, while the, while people were going to grocery stores and not able to find things on the shelf, it had a sort of um, a really negative, apocalyptic almost feeling when you walk into the store and you spend that time and you go and there's something that's not on the shelves that you need. And I think we worked really hard. Every morning we would wake up super early and start hitting all of our vendors and even though it was a limited number of something you could get every day, we were there every day trying to get it. But it We'd may- go to some places and John would change his shirt to make it seem like he was so much. Nice snitching. Nice snitching. You got to do it. I mean, because it was just such a fun time. Like, well, we it just, was yeah, wild. I mean, we just had wild. so many customers coming in. And, and I, I remember an older lady coming in, and she looked so stressed out that she couldn't find the things that she was looking for at the grocery store that she had always gone to. And to come into our store and be able to find it, granted, there were only two or three on the shelf because that's all I could get that day. But you start to see how it was affecting people and stressing mm-hmm. out people and and especially older folks that, that hadn't had to deal with this kind of a thing before and, and really were vulnerable. It just um, working harder felt better, right? It just it just felt good to, to, to be able to give them the things that they were coming in for. And it really carried us through. The food was always there and, and I mean during that time we had the freeze. The big uh-huh. freeze, right? Mm-hmm. Which is another mm-hmm. instance where we didn't know what to do. That was wild too. But we knew that we had gas. So we could heat water. We knew we had food because we could cook it on the stovetop with our gas. I mean, we were cooking with flashlights and, you know, that kind of stuff. But the opportunity to do that meant a lot. And the community just came through and really just supported us for all those years that could have easily been the end of Henderson and Kane. Yeah, that was like three days we went without power here. Yeah. And it was the good thing was that it was so cold that we didn't have to worry about the walk in coming out of temperature. Yeah, because yeah. mm. it's on the exterior yeah. wall, right? right? So it was like frozen, basically. <laughs> uh, and then one day, on one of the coldest days, uh, Veronica was giving away hot coffee and hot chocolate. And, yeah. and well, that was another challenge because we could not brew coffee because we couldn't grind the beans, mm. but we had a huge batch of cold brew. So we literally heated up cold brew yeah. to serve hot coffee. Yeah. Uh, and some of these folks, these old houses are fantastic, except for in the dead of winter and yeah. the dead right, of summer, right? right? Not, like, not yeah. built for that. Yeah, the yeah, insulation <laughs> isn't that. So we had folks coming in and just wanting to be inside because it was warmer because the stoves were going and the gas stove was a big old burner at that time, big 12 burner or something. Mm-hmm. And we keep it real hot in here. Uh, but it was um, those opportunities, to get back back to it, you know, those those opportunities to really serve um, was really what helped keep us together. And and we thrived in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I guess hanging on really is thriving during that time. But, uh, yeah, we were hanging on, and it was good, and we formed a lot of relationships with a lot of people. And it was a side of the industry that you really got to focus on and highlight because it was before that it was 100% about food. You know, we were kind people. We were good people. We expected the same from customers, and they were great. Uh, but the food was what it was about for the you know for that time starting out, and then to really get an experience in the rest of it reminded us of how important that was, and it's fifty percent of it, right? Like you can have great food all you want, but if people don't aren't happy, then what right. do they, they can't care? relate. They're not going to come. Uh, yeah, what do they care? And that's what barbecue is, man. Barbecue is oh, like it's happy food. I mean, in Texas especially, I mean, how many little towns are there where people gather around a, a central barbecue pit? And feed a whole town like that was that was a huge yeah. thing in Texas, right? We, actually, we took a tour. Well, took a tour. We went on a road trip uh, where we were hunting down old brick pits um, and finding them and taking photos of them 
kind of documenting where they are uh, because they're kind of dying out at this point um, with all the you know the new makers that are making uh, with plate steel or pipe. Um, and you can go to these old places where there's churches, uh, community center, VFW halls. And they have these brick pits, and it's a, again a reminder that, like whole little towns used to come together on a day of the year and would cook enough pork, pulled pork, for the whole city, basically. Yeah. Um, we kind of hope to get back to that uh, Dude, here that, in Houston. That would be, that would be fantastic. We, we've done a lot, of, a lot of stories and a lot of um, podcasts over the years uh, just talking about the history of barbecue and, and what, it, what it did for everybody, what it meant for mm-hmm. everybody. And it just, as you're saying, like, just whole cities just got together on a, a Sunday or, yeah. or whatever and just just had the, the the best time in your life and the, the whole creation of this podcast that we're here now was originated started because we were sitting around basically a barbecue pit we were grilling and mm-hmm. hanging out and talking and telling stories yeah. and and i was like we should just record this right and right. and then that started this whole thing and it, but it, it goes back to uh, we did competition barbecue and then you go into these, these competition barbecues and it is like, everybody's trying to win, mm-hmm. but they're all so nice mm-hmm. and they help you out. Mm-hmm. I, we, we've seen instances uh, in our own, own experience, like, like, Hey, we, we don't have enough charcoal. Can we, or we don't have enough wood. Can we borrow some wood from the team next to you? And, and, and you mm-hmm. take wood from them. They're like, yeah, Hey, no problem. Here you go. What else you need? And then, uh, it, but it's like th- there was no question asked. It, yeah. it, honestly, it's like yeah. here you go. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, that's that's the community of barbecue. Right, right. You know, it can it can be uh, it it can be very in your face competition where you're, you know. But at the same time, I mean, ninety uh, percent of them are all cooking the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're all cooking this low and slow, mm-hmm. twelve hour cook. You know, it's gotten a little bit more competitive now with, yeah. with the drum smokers and, and whatever else. But I do like, I'm a big fan of the of the of the brick, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the brick pits. And so obviously you're 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 chewing down uh, wood, right? Charcoal, mm-hmm. and, and you're going and spreading. Is that is that how that would? That no. So the brick pit would be more in line. Like, um, so what you'd have is the brick pit, and then you'd have a, a on one of the longer or uh, one of the ends of the of the pit, you would basically have a small box. Sometimes you don't even have a box. Sometimes you just have a, a, a square cut out, yep. and you put the fire right on the floor. <clears throat> and as long as you have an exhaust on the other end of it, it's going to draw that smoke and that that yep. fire, that heat through. Mm. Um, Smitty's in Lockhart is a perfect example of that. Um, and again, one of the most like primitive like places. Uh, you know, I know it's had another name, the family name, uh, starting early 1900s, but it is still uh, it, it, the family that that has the building. Uh, and uses those brick pits the way that they did when I was growing up. I mean, my grandfather, my grandfather, my dad's side used to take us out there um, when we were little kids, and Smitty's was where we went because he lived in Maxwell and would take a horse and a buggy with his uncle there to go get meat so cool. and That's then go history. back because yeah. it was a uh, before they were selling barbecue, they were just a meat uh, they were processing okay. basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you go into that place, you'll see the old wooden. Uh, walk-in coolers you'll see the the track with the hooks from the outside wall all the way into the cooler trace it back I and mean, so i didn't know anything about it then of course but uh, you know from both ends barbecue was super important in our family for sure and um those brick pits are just i mean i don't know man they're just dying you know it's it sometimes you see them crumbling uh, my grandfather's building is no longer there but the bricks are in a pile that my uncle saved restored or er, brought them back and the sun and the rain have just kind of restored them to look brand new over all these years. Who knows if anything will ever happen with them again, but they're still there. Yeah. And um, there's even here in our little neighborhood, right on this street here, about three houses down, four houses down, on the right-hand side, there's a little brick pit in the backyard. And it looks like a little cathedral almost, and that's how I remember a lot of them being. Um, it's not a smoking pit, it doesn't look like, but it's a grill. And it seems like I remember them more commonly when our, them being more common when I was younger, and um, that's pretty fantastic. Now, in the city of Houston, unfortunately, we can't have them in our buildings or in our restaurants. I would guess there's probably very few cities where where it's allowed these days. Yeah, um, I mean, if you want to get technical, it has to do with the fire bricks themselves yeah. not having any kind of structural integrity, and so when they do reach a certain temp, they actually can start to break down. Yeah. And so the city doesn't like to use them 
for that reason. That's mm. just one of the many yeah. reasons. But There's a place called DeHannis, Texas, and um, we kept hearing these old-timers tell us, oh, yeah, the, there's a DeHannis, there's a DeHannis, brick pit, or DeHannis pit out there. DeHannis pit, DeHannis pit. And I, I couldn't figure out what it was. And then somebody, one of the old, old guys explained to me that, oh, DeHannis is the town where they make that fire brick, mm. and each brick is stamped with DeHannis on it. So if you ever see a DeHannis brick that more than likely is a fire brick that, yeah. can, that can take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but brick pits, man. And love to see people's pictures of them because uh, we know that you can only find them if you know where they are, right? Like, I guess a good chance is go to VF, an old VFW or go to an old park or something uh, where they might have one. Some old churches have them as well, uh, but they, just, they aren't everywhere. And I, I love seeing them. I love seeing pictures of them. And people send us pictures. You know, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, no, definitely. So what kind of pit are you running back there? So we have a, a J&J, uh, a little pit. Is that right? Was it a... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have a Klaus. I have a small little Klaus that we're running off of. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, it's not a big pit. It's only about 600 gallons. Um, and it's 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 a nice pit. I feel good about it. Yeah. You know? It's got two stacks on it. And we only use uh, uh, oak and uh, pecan. And so it's a pretty steady machine, and we do it every day. Every day. <laughs> nice. So if you had to say, like, um, are y- y'all, uh, obviously brisket's king in Texas, but, I mean, uh, you're always doing something different, right? So sure. y- you want to, are you, are y'all, are y'all, are y'all, you're not just, obviously, brisket ribs and whatever else, but are y'all incorporating other other meals, other foods? Are y'all doing... So, we're, you know, we when we get the opportunity to do, like, um, this winter, we're doing what's called our smoke sessions. Our smoke sessions is our dinner series. And um, any chance I get to kind of to do something outside of the, the standard brisket or the Trinity, I will. And so we did uh, smoked turkey breasts. Um, uh, we did smoked roasted acorn squash. Uh, you know, really, just really standard fall uh, uh, meal, and it was really nice, and uh, that's a good opportunity to do that. Now, I think the, you know, the, um, oh. the, uh, the culture, the, you know, pe- I guess the new wave or the, the, the new wave of the uh, barbecue is to kind of put your culture on top of it, because barbecue mm-hmm. is so primitive, right? Like mm-hmm. smoke, fire, meat, right. that's like that's, it. it's human, it's human, so it's so primitive, and um and, it, you know, we started, when we first started, and when my grandparents had it, they were doing tamales with smoked brisket, which I never knew, right? Like, I didn't know, like, how amazing that was, I guess, or how different it might later become. Um, it was just normal. And so it's hard to find tamales that are as good as my grandmother's, no, oh, right. no matter how hard I try. No matter how hard I try. It's, yeah, it's, he even it's says it's that about hard. our own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like they're not, you know, not quite there yet, just trying to figure it out. Um but uh, and I think that's the new wave of things. So you do have, we do now have Vietnamese uh, uh, spin on barbecue uh, in Brooklyn. There's a kosher barbecue guy. Uh, I know there's a halal barbecue uh, now, um, and so it's a good opportunity for people in Houston or I guess anywhere to really try a new spin on again, you know, fire meat, mm-hmm. yeah, and right, smoke, right, right? right. Yeah. And so if you think about it, every culture, everybody. Has all of that. all of them has yeah. that right, and so and and oftentimes it's the best version of whatever it is that they're mm-hmm. doing. If right. it's cooked over fire or coal or whatever, it's just fantastic. Um, and so uh, we we you'll find us dipping into our Hispanic culture or Mexican culture by by doing things like our smoked brisket tacos. Uh, we just are starting to do um, uh, smoked brisket enchiladas. Mm. Uh, smoked brisket flour So I'm hungry now. Yep. Just, uh, <laughs> and buy who a knew? House down here. <laughs> and who knew how simple it was? But uh, queso with brisket on top is pretty amazing. Oh, right? Yeah, right. Like, you just can't beat right. it. Uh, and and so we um, we we do that. Like that. That's kind of it's using. Uh, we're making our own corn tortillas in house, and we're using smoked tallow, brisket tallow, uh, in replace you know, to replace the butter. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit of smoked salt, maybe as well. So it's got a different element, some more depth to it than normal, I think. Yeah. Um, so that's what you see us doing here, and that's kind of the direction we normally go in. Um, yeah. Because it's it's home to mm-hmm. us for sure. You know, smoking meats isn't just cooking; it's an art form. The aroma, those deep flavors, the patience—it's a whole experience. And behind every great artist, there's the right set of tools. If you're aiming to build your own barbecue pit 
or dreaming of a custom design tailored just for you, SmokerBuilder.com has your back. Led by Frank Cox, their expertise is unmatched. Offering blueprints, kits, and insights, they turn every barbecue dream into a flavorful reality. Imagine your backyard, the center of attention, and at the heart of it, a smoker that's uniquely yours. It's more than just equipment. It's about crafting those unforgettable moments. And with the guidance of Frank and his team, you're setting the stage for magic. So whether you're a seasoned pit master or taking your first steps into the smoky world, head over to smokerbuilder.com, fill up your carts, and be sure to use the promo code GRABTHEBRISKET in all caps to receive your 10% discount. Smoke on. Hey, you there. We've got a question for you. Are you tired of clickbait stories and the loudest voices driving discussions in culture and entertainment? If so, I'm Dylan. I'm Kendall. And I'm Corey. And we host the podcast From the Middle. We're middle-class guys living in the middle of America, in the middle chapters of our lives with points of view somewhere in the middle. We take a more reasonable and centrist approach in our discussions covering genres like comedy, culture, entertainment, and interviews with really interesting folks like business owners, comic creators, doctors, news anchors, New York Times best-selling illustrators, professional stand-up comics, and more. We really value a relaxed and conversational podcast. One that we hope is so fun and laid back, you'll forget you're not actually hanging out with us. So search at From the Mid Pod, just like it sounds, or check us out everywhere you can find podcasts. That's that's the uh, that's the thing about having uh, I mean having anything right that's yours. Uh, you, you're free. You're free to do whatever you want, right? right? And you're free to make it your own. And I think um, I, I don't know. I think. I, I, I love cooking, right? I love not just smoking. I love in the kitchen cooking. I'm just I'm built that way. Uh, grew up. My grandmother had a, a, a gas station and a, a little restaurant, right? And that's cool. so we worked Burger in joint, it, right? yeah. yeah. Oh wow! So <laughs> I, I'm I'm standing on uh, a milk crates, milk crates and I'm I'm flipping burgers in the back yeah. at, at five years old. You know, <laughs> I, that was normal, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, using a butcher knife and and like <laughs> cutting up vegetables was normal for me at a very young age. And I don't think like but, well, my grandmother, we didn't. She didn't drive, right? We walked everywhere, so we we walked home, and yeah. that's you know, house was uh, probably about a block and a half, two blocks away, and every morning at, at five in the morning, I was up. It, James and I are twins, mm-hmm. uh, and we were up, and we were we were walking to. Uh, uh, it was called uh, the Strong Center, and we walked in, and we we opened everything up, and it, there's a process to open anything up, right? because you have to be there because. Ranchers and everybody get up early, and they, yeah. they need to come in and have That's breakfast, right. and they want to have fresh coffee. Turn the lights on, That's turn the it. pumps That's on right. to the gas. Wow. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and then we, we did all of that, and then uh, and then we when we drove our uh, rode our bikes to school, you know, like maybe about a couple miles away, you know, and that was normal. Every morning up, and we always had a job to do, you know, and that was I don't know. I I feel like I feel like it's what you got here. Yeah, yeah. We you know? we we always get uh, when we go back to um, Strawn, and we run into the people that like. Uh, Strawn Center is like I've s- never had a burger quite like wow. yeah. your grandmother. They still talk about it. They yeah. still talk about it. Yeah. It's like yeah. it, they they have not. It, she set the bar here, and yeah. it, maybe maybe it was like you were mentioning here. Maybe it's that nostalgia a little bit. Maybe it's that, that you being there. It was a good burger, but it, it wasn't. Not, it wasn't ever what it is now. Because right. now people talk about it. And you're like it's always this great burger that right. you can never right. obtain. Right. Uh, but but one thing I I, I feel like food really reciprocates what you put into it and the way you cook it and the time you take to make it uh and i think that you it it unfolds that way and you taste it you know it's weird i I could give you a recipe and we could execute it the same way one will come out different than the other one and and i think it's what you put into it from yourself Mm -hmm. and 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 people you know there's there's certain things that everybody makes at home and you're like this is so freaking good right and you go somewhere else and and they're like oh i made your recipe and you try it you're like well, that ain't my recipe. Right. I don't know. What, right. you, Jan, you right. forgot right. the love. It's fine. It's something. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Jan, Jan has a fantastic um, Bloody Mary recipe I that do. he makes. Yeah. He, he's won like five or six like competitions with his thing. And he tells me what it is. Like everything, <laughs> you do this, you do this, and that, yeah. and that. I have all the ingredients. And, then, and my wife loves loves the Bloody Bloody Mary. And I'll go other places. Hey, James, make me a Bloody Mary. I'm like, great. I need all this right here. And I put it together and... It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I'm using the same ingredients, but 
obviously he has just that little that little passion, sure. that little panache mm-hmm. to yeah. to get all that the stuff shake put together. Of the to uh, yeah. sauce or one, something, one right? One extra like, little dab of so this. Whatever it is, or holding back a little, who knows? Well, right. for us, that would be John's mom's <laughs> Texas chocolate sheet cake. Yeah. Ooh. And yeah. she will hand anyone that asks that recipe, but it doesn't matter because it will never oh, taste as never good as hers. Same. Come on. And so she actually makes us a sheet cake for the shop that we sell, which is only hers, and she once promised that she would teach... Uh, Maddie, my stepdaughter, how to make it. She's like, I will will roll through the whole <laughs> recipe beginning mm-hmm. to end, and I will teach her how to make it, and no one else. And I'm like, you're holding out on an ingredient. Like, there's, something's there's, going something's on here. Going on. Something, right. is something is something's missing. Going on. Uh, I, I was watching my mom. I was like, um, uh, I think she was making chick fried steak, and she was making mm-hmm. the gravy. Um, so, obviously, use the drippings from... Uh, the the chicken fried steak and she's like okay we're gonna make the gravy for it I'm like okay. I'm just like eyeballing I'm like okay I'm watching everything she's putting in there she's like you do this this and that and then she got the flour and all that stuff into the uh, making kind of the roux beginning of the room she's like stirring the flour it's cooking it browning it and she's like I was like okay so when do you when do you pour the milk in she's like uh well when you smell the the, the smell and I'm like well, I don't smell? I don't know what that means what like, smell? is there a, I, I'm more like what's what's the time right, like, right, uh, right, right, right. And she's like you know it, not burning but you, you you smell it cooking and this and it's like okay that, that's probably about time I'm like I can we just go off color or whatever she's like okay now add the milk and she adds the milk into it she's like okay but you don't want to add all milk so just you know and she I'm like I I yeah, and I make gravy at home, and it's not the that's same. That's working yeah. it, man. That's just yeah, the right. That's, that's just yeah. how you work yeah. it. It's yeah, amazing. It's amazing. I wonder how many people that listen to this probably have a family situation mm-hmm. like that as well, right? Like oh. a recipe in the family that just can't get it or just don't remember it the right way. Or, you know, it's it's always important to document that stuff when yes. you can, man. We and, uh, and if you got the loved ones, if you if you got them there with you right now. Yeah. Please yeah, go that's right. to them right now and just sit there and soak up and learn as much Save as you can. It, right? yeah, Especially Thanksgiving's right around the corner here. Yeah. And uh, uh, grandparents, grandmother, yep. everybody, the, the food that they produce is unmatched. And yep. we're still trying to yeah. recreate it. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. important. Especially here in Texas, man. There's a lot of good food. There's so many cultures here in Texas, right? Like, mm-hmm. And we were talking about this recently, how barbecue is, is exactly that, right? Like barbecue is very german it's very Mexican. So when you look in the yeah. hill country and you see... The vaqueros, man. When you That's... see... You look in the hill country and you see a Mexican named town next to a German named town mm-hmm. next to a Mexican named town next to a German yeah. name, Right? Like, that's barbecue. That's Texas cuisine right there. That's Definitely. Central Texas barbecue. And so, man, all of that different culture and everybody having their own recipe books or their own mm-hmm. recipes, whatever it might be. That's crazy important. We we started very early on trying to you, you do some of the research and t- talking about where the origins of barbecue yeah. came from. Where did it start? And, and a lot of body, a lot of people kind of like theorize like this culture started it versus this culture or whatever. I'm not really sure what the correct hey, answer is. I already is. know what it is. Um, hey, what? God made fire. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's right. Yeah, and forever. we started cooking food on top of it. That's, I mean, that's grilling. Yeah, well, right. Right. I mean, like, right. but yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we, we went back and, and we, we went back to, you know, the, 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 the vaqueros, uh, and I'm 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 not not I'm not saying it correctly, right? But uh, but it's but still yeah. cute. Yeah, yeah. Right? Right. <laughs> your R's are I got, wrong. I got I got to like, roll my R. Right? Yeah. Roll something. Vaquero, <laughs> vaquero. I could I could do this, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, but but everything lends the the, the, the German influence definitely, mm-hmm. right? I mean, uh, but I think that's what makes it so special. And then you have these restaurants that take, and I think they pull from their family. Everybody's mm-hmm. pulling from their own own family their own everybody has that cook everybody Mm -hmm. has that uncle or the aunt Mm -hmm. or the grandmother or the Mm -hmm. mom whatever so Mm -hmm. i don't know i think that's just what makes it so special but one thing i want to say is uh we're talking about recipes and whatever there was this we we saw this that there was this recipe like these i don't know if it was cookies or something right it it was like um it was like the uh world were not best cookies you could get right and everybody talked about these cookies and this whole family and nobody would it was, a, it was a secret recipe, secret recipe that Grandma had that, of these cookies yeah. that it, the best cookies in the world. And, and, she, <laughs> and, and she, she would, wouldn't tell anybody. She wouldn't tell anybody. She would pass it down, yeah. but you had to, you had to like 
yeah. not tell anybody. So it was like grandmother would pass it down to mother, mother would pass it down to daughter. And very it, secretive. Very secretive. And it gets to the point where she gets, the, I guess the daughter gets the recipe finally. Well, it's like, well, it's like a grandkid, right? Gra- yeah, it's, grandkid. It's a grandkid from the grandmother. She's got the recipe now. Yeah. You know? And right. it's and it's the recipe off of the Nestle <laughs> Toll House hey. bag of chocolate chips. 100%. Oh my right? I guess you'll never forget. Right? Because so, right. she's, like, she's like, I got this recipe, and here it is. And then she turns the bag over, and she's like, Jesus. <laughs> okay. There it is. Gotcha. Yeah. You know? So who, I mean, surely somebody just gave it up. Right. But, that's, <laughs> but that's probably the testimony yeah. to the fact that it's that that connection that somehow makes it the best cookie in the world, right? Like, yeah. mm-hmm. even if yeah. they've had it, even if they had that recipe somewhere else, so, is the fact that it was grandma's. Right? Yeah, yeah. So right. what I think is grandma never gave the recipe out. No, I right, think grandma right. grandma <laughs> took the Nestle recipe it, right? yeah. and, right. and, and she gave it out to she says, you can use this one, right? But she's like, ain't nobody eating these cookies, That's right? right? Yeah. That's what I, I want to think that way. Maybe not, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's just funnier. I don't, yeah. yeah. My mom swears funny. that, my mom swears that the, uh, the secret and the, uh, the cake that she makes, the sheet cake that she makes is the fact that it calls for buttermilk, but she doesn't buy the buttermilk. She makes her own. Yeah. Well, we've tried that and still mom, it doesn't work the same. Mm-hmm. So, Sorry, mom. so, so she, you know, I, I feel like she's throwing us curveballs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure my daughter will get the recipe, which is great because I can live out my years still eating it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's just funny because we give her a hard time about it. And it makes, it's one of the few things that uh, that we enjoy poking fun at mom about. And uh, she laughs and has a good time with it, too. So nice. It's really great. But uh, she comes here and makes us a uh, cake uh, probably once a week. Twice a week, a couple times a week, yeah. yeah. A couple times a week, she'll come here and make us People the cake, love it. and, uh, and uh, mm. it flies off the shelf. I, I don't have any on the shelf right now, actually. Actually, we just cut one up. Oh, we did. Yeah. Nice. So, so they go pretty good. Uh, but it's again one of those things that's uh, that family vibe. And Texas is it's so important for people to yeah. save their recipes and pass them on if they can. Try to have a family cookbook. It's as important as a family Bible to some people, I'm sure. Right to pass mm-hmm. that on, yeah. Especially. If you can save that cookbook or even copy the cookbook in grandma's script um, with her handwriting or whatever notes that they put into it, imagine that two or three generations from now, five mm-hmm. generations from now, you know, six generations you, from now. We, we actually, uh, my wife got a cutting board. And on the cutting board is um, her grandmother's recipe, but it's in her grandmother's handwriting. Oh, wow. That yeah. was cut onto there. And it's it's pretty freaking cool. Yeah, how special yeah. is that? Yeah, yeah. so it sits up in the and thing and it's like, and it's like a, um, it's like a sauce, right? And uh, every once in a while, Amy's like, "I'm making the sauce." Yeah, you know, and it just sits out all day long. Wow, that's it's so cool. cool. Yeah, that's so mm. cool. Yeah, and we're full of them. People are full of them. Families are full of them. Is again, I, I'm beating a dead horse probably, but it's just so important to document that stuff and keep it in the family for sure. Yeah, it means yeah. a lot. It, it, I've, I've got a uh, just. If there was one thing, obviously, and you, uh, two things. One, you said a, or you said something earlier. You said disarming. And you said it, it's to disarm somebody. It's like, don't just ask them what they want, right? Hey, ha, hey how are you? How's your day going? Yeah, whatever. I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. I, I, I walk around to every, every, people that, every person that I work with in the office. When I come in, I, I go touch everybody, right? And I'm like, hey, what was the best thing? Like, I'm always asking weird questions to like, <laughs> hey, what's the best part of your day today? Right? To people that don't even know me, you know, hey, what's the best thing happy to you today? And I always get that first look like, well, actually, this happened or whatever, you know? It could be a waiter. It could be anything. It doesn't matter. But disarming, disarming is walking through the front door because the vibe y'all have created is very disarming. That's, mm-hmm. it's amazing, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. And the, it, the second you open the door, you're like, well, I don't care what kind of day I had. I'm right. having a pretty good damn That's day great. right the now. Thank you. Yeah. The aesthetics, yeah. the, the, the vibes. I mean, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. So uh, I know you mentioned earlier we, we had like off the uh, mic conversations, whatever. But this room that we're sitting in right here, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So again, uh, this place started 1937 as um, as a general store. Um, I think more uh, fruits, vegetables, sundries, that kind of thing. Uh, obviously, you can imagine the 30s and the 40s. Um, later on, I believe in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, it was sold to the Garcia family. And they had a place called Garcia's Meat Market, and uh, the building. When I first got, when I first got, was able to get into the building and look at it, 
uh, I, the walk-in freezer was still here. So we are sitting in what used to be the walk-in freezer where the hooks, the butcher's uh, station was in the corner. It still had the hooks in the ceiling where they were hanging half cows. Um, and they were basically butchering them here in the freezer, of course, to keep it super fresh and mm-hmm. and, uh, and ready to be sold. Wow. Um, but it was great. And it was actually from that door there to here. So what is that, 20 feet? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 20 feet by... I don't know what that width is, but... Yeah, and I think originally the building actually stopped at that column row. So uh, in the 30s, this was their residence. And so at some point, the building was expanded um, before the meat market came in. Mm. Yeah. Nice. And so uh, the neighborhood really had gone through a lot of change, of course. Um, And um, fortunately, the neighborhood is now historically protected. Um, But a lot of the homes were protected... Maybe sometimes unintentionally, we have some friends a block over who are restoring the home to its original form, um, and it's it's beautiful. Uh, they were fortunate though that as they were peeling back the layers, it's funny because he tells us like we peeled back the layer from the '80s and then we peer, peeled back the layer from the '50s and then they got to the layer that was original to the house with the old shiplap and the old uh, uh, the brick. Um, where the fire stove used to be oh, and yeah. all of that, like the hearth, is that what it's called? Uh, so, so like, it's so original, and, and the neighborhood is special for that reason, and they were able to just kind of peel back and find that. I think they said it was actually three houses that had been oh, that's right. brought together, that's right. yeah. and so they started to find, like, the original seams of when the houses first were connected. Dude, that yeah. is so freaking is crazy. cool. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. It speaks to the neighborhood, for sure, and it speaks to the different vibe and the... The people that, that live here in the 6th Ward are often heavily invested in, of course, where their homes are, and you know, the home that they're going to live in, but they're heavily invested into the symbiosis here between all the neighbors and the houses all being so the same. And uh, even though, I, like I said, it's, it's, you know, Washington Avenue does get a little busy. Memorial is right behind us. It sometimes gets a little busy. Downtown gets a little busy. But this pocket is so, so slow. slow. Yeah, and peaceful. A lot of walk, a lot of people walking, biking, kids walking around. You know, um, just really good place to be. Really good place to be. Um, yeah, very cool. And so out, outside, uh, just switch the gears a little bit. Outside of, I know this is life for you guys. Uh, what are some of the other passions that you guys have uh, in your life? Or what, what do we do outside of work? Is that a trick question? No, yeah. not, this no. is what are you talking about. They're, they live here. They're, I know they do. They're they're they got a the bunk place. bed in the back. I mean, the trouble is, is yeah. that we leave here and all we do is talk about work yeah. in a different kind of way. Yeah. Um, John and I love to go to estate sales. So a lot of the vintage finds that you see in the shop are things that we've picked up from different estate sales. So that's probably one of the things that we enjoy doing on a regular basis. But outside of that, I mean, it's like we'll go somewhere, we'll go on vacation or something, take a small little road trip, and it ultimately somehow becomes tied into barbecue. barbecue. Mm, (laughs) Like like when we went to go look at those brick pits, we considered that a little getaway. And we were still... You know, we were still hunting barbecue pits, and we knew we were going to stop at Smitty's, right? We we often find ourselves, wherever we're going, we head west, because we know the hill country is west. We know El Paso is yes. west. We know the valley is southwest, right? Like, like that's kind of the way it goes for us. And uh, uh, barbecue pits and smoked meats from wherever we can find it, mm-hmm. try it out, try out what people are doing. That's our vacation. What's, <laughs> you, what's your favorite thing that, 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 that you currently have on the menu which like that you ever had like what what is your favorite dish? sure i mean i'm super happy with the ribs right now i'm super super happy with the ribs right now um i'm very happy with our smoked brisket enchiladas that we uh, we're producing right now as well um we have a magnificent lady that that is uh executing those for us in our in the back there um and she cares so much about them like it's it's life you right? can feel it yeah. you can feel you it feel for love. sure yeah, you can feel it for sure. She's so passionate about all this stuff, though. She's really great. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy with all of those things. Um, another thing that I'm super happy with, maybe it's not food-related, but something I'm super happy with is that my daughter um, graduated from University of Texas and, um, and decided that uh, after working corporate for a couple of years that she wanted to come help grow the business and, and really plant, help us you know, get, get organized. And she did that absolutely. Um, 
we've seen a lot of great improvements with her here and the fact that I get to see her every day just yeah, about yeah, is right. super important and it's a family business my grandfather um, Ambrose Science he would say I remember him saying that he felt like a very lucky man because he would speaking to what you were saying earlier that he would come into the store turn the lights on and he knew that that day as soon as he turned the lights on his family was going to be around him and his friends were going to come and visit him right have some beers, mm. eat some food, things like that. And when he said that, he, when you're younger, kind of in passing, it's okay, you know. But as you get a little older, nostalgia, yeah, you, see it. you mm. see it, things mean something. And I'll never forget that. I feel like a lucky man because when I turn these lights on, my family is around me and my friends are coming to visit me. And that's, man, that's that sums it up, I think, for us here, for sure. Yeah. So as much as we sometimes complain about... Um, uh, you know, not having enough time to do the things that outside of this place. Uh, Veronica and I are very much into this little little restaurant and everything about it. And it's not perfect and it's not fancy, uh, but it's truly authentic. I feel like, and nothing makes us happier than when we have customers that that enjoy themselves, that feel good about what we're doing. And a big compliment to that is that they bring someone else. That's it. They it's, come back. Um, right. It, they come yeah. back and they bring other people with them because nobody wants to take someone to a place that they weren't happy with, right? Or, That's right. right. And, and, and I think this place is somewhat of a hidden gem so that when people come in, they feel like they're showing a secret to someone. And it feels good to clue them in. And yeah. uh, Veronica and Maddie run the show here. They, they are the brains of the operation, as I like to say. And so the reason people know about us is because of the work that they do on social media. There's not a lot of money spent on marketing and, and general advertising. It's just not something that we've spent a lot of money on. But the word of mouth is what keeps us mm -hmm. busy, is what has customers here. Um, it just feels good. That's the biggest compliment that we can get is that someone yeah. comes back. Well, yeah. well, I mean, people are just so invested in us and you know when they ask you, like, how is business? Yeah, right. And we get that question a lot. And most of the time, like, why? Does it seem like we're hurting? Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, everything's great. But that's what they want to hear is yeah. that everything is great. Yeah. And then that usually lends a, well, what, what else can I do? Or what else can I buy? Or I brought so-and-so here the other day. Or yeah. I fed my whole crew working on my house. And so it's really kind of interesting the way that they feel like they're contributing to yeah. our success. Right, yeah. sure. Sure, right, and they are. Yeah. What's uh, what's what's the best thing that you that you have on the menu? Mm -hmm. Come on. Um, I mean, my favorite, which is a bummer you can only get on the weekends during brunch, uh, but the boudin Benedict. Ooh. Mm. We that do the amazing. loose uh, loose boudin, like kind of fry it on the on the uh, flat top, and then it gets nice little post -date, poached egg, the hollandaise, just like something about like the acidity. With like the creaminess of the egg, it's just so delicious. It's I didn't miss my opportunity amazing. this morning, so I'm kind of regretting <laughs> it. <laughs> and then instead of on an English muffin, we do it on a, uh, a piece of bolillo, so the little white bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the I guess pan francés or the little French bread. So we take that and we um, put that at the bottom, so it's really nice. And once the hollandaise hits the boudin, it kind of sinks in between the grains of rice and mm -hmm. the pork and stuff. Yeah. So it's so really, good. really good. Yeah. That's a really good dish. Yeah, great. Cool. That's a really good one. Very cool. Yeah, that's that one of my good. favorites. Really one. Yeah. yeah, she killed your answer, man. Yeah, I know, <laughs> man. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm embarrassed by what my uh, favorite thing. I eat here. a lot of ribs, though. So yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just don't. kidding. But, it's a lot of sound amazing. I am a little embarrassed by what my favorite thing to eat here is because I eat it just about every time in passing, which is a, a little boat, and I'll put some brisket in it with potato salad in it, and then cover it and cover the potato salad in barbecue sauce. Yeah, and it's okay. kind of yeah. weird, but it's super it's good. Weird. It sounds good. Yeah. Everybody it. here says <laughs> it's weird, <laughs> uh, but it, it feels like what, what is it? The uh, the chef's split is what we called it, and so we Texas would take split. a Texas split, yeah. and we would take a sausage of your choice, and we would butterfly it like a banana, and then we put a scoop of potato salad like ice cream on it. Yeah, and then we put chopped beef on top of that like chocolate sprinkles, and then we put sauce on it like chocolate sauce. Yeah, and sounds amazing. Dang. It's weird, it but it's so good. It hits. So I'm, good. I'm into it. It's so good. No, that's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's great. Well, John, Veronica, we absolutely appreciate y'all having us out here. This has been amazing. If the folks want to come find the place or find your social media, all the places, uh, can you share that? Sure. So we're located at the corner of Henderson and Kane, just like the name. That's uh, 715 Henderson Street in the Old Sixth Ward. 
And as far as social media, it's the same handle for really mu- pretty much everything, which is at Henderson and Kane. At Henderson and Kane. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we'll that put is. a link down below for, uh, for the listeners to find it. That's Thanks. it. So. Thanks. Well, are you guys ready to eat? I'm ready to yeah, eat something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 As soon as I walk like, in and we smell it. Eaten, I so. know. Let's do it. Yes. Yes. Let's go. Let's Thanks a lot, guys. Mm-hmm. We really appreciate it. We appreciate y'all. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dying it, Bobby. Just grab the brisket. We'd like to give a special thanks to Suckle Buster's Barbecue Rubs and Sauces, Bonner's Fiesta Spices, Cooley Nation Custom Koozies, Cambro Manufacturing, Yeti Coolers, The Smoke Sheep Barbecue Newsletter, and Dow Strong Knives. We definitely appreciate your support.